Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rata, where we explore the human side of tech. I'm your host, Olivia, and today joining me I have Dr. Rob to talk a little bit about his career and what it's like being a science educator. Hello, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Rob. Oh, it's um, a pleasure. So to start off with, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit for those who somehow haven't heard of you before or haven't seen you as part of their childhood. Um, tell us a little bit about um, who you are and what you do. Um, well, uh, I just started off, I guess, um, when I left UQ um, quite a few years ago now. Uh, I got my first job with CSIRO Education, um, mainly because I sort of didn't really know what I wanted to do and it seemed like an interesting job. Uh, it involves mostly going out to schools to teach kids about science and take experiments out. It's kind of like a traveling scientist, I guess, with, with experiments along the way. Um, and with that job came along this role that they sort of tacked on, um, which was doing some stories for Totally Wild when and as need be. So I didn't really know what that was going to entail or what it was all about. It just sort of was, oh, okay, sure. Uh, and then that started up, it was very ad hoc sort of basis. They'd call up and say, we'd, we'd like to film a couple of stories, one of you today free. And it was usually kind of simple stuff, you know, what, how stuff works, those kinds of things, sometimes with kids as well. And that went along for a few years and it was kind of fun, but my day job was very much with CSRO education. Uh, and then Channel 10 decided in their wisdom that they wanted to have uh, an actual science show rather than just a bit of science content throughout Totally Wild. So they spoke to CSIRO and they asked me if I'd like to be involved. I didn't, was kind of flattered, but didn't really know a lot about the world of TV because they would just come and visit where I worked every now and then. That was it at the time. Um, somewhere along the way, they'd also discovered uh, that I had a PhD. So they said, you know, can we call you Dr. Rob as opposed to just Rob that we've been calling you? Uh, and that was kind of the start of it, really. Um, a show called Scope started up and the pilot got greenlit by whoever does these things. <laughs> Um, and that was the start of it. And I kind of figured at the start it might go for I, – I sort of figured if it went for three years, that was great. If it got to five years, I would be ecstatic. Um, and 10 or 11 years later, I was sort of going, wow, that, that was an amazing ride. It's probably time to move on other things. But, yeah, it was, it was a heap of fun. Um, and during that time, obviously a lot changed in the world of broadcast TV. Suddenly there were multi-channels and then there was streaming and all sorts of other things came into the world of – Kids TV, I think, changed a little bit as well. But, um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun making kids TV, although I guess whilst it was aimed at kids, we knew we were on in a general time slot, so we always made it, I suppose, more for a general audience rather than trying to dumb things down. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So looking, I guess, starting from the start of your journey, what did you study in university and what was your PhD on? Um, I studied chemistry, so I did a Bachelor of Science and I figured out about halfway through that it was sort of going to be in the area of chemistry or biochemistry and I didn't really know why. They're just to be the subjects, I guess, that clicked. Um, ended up doing chemistry and to be honest, I only really did postgraduate because I didn't get a job, as in I didn't try and get a job. Um, I saw how many people graduated with a Bachelor of Science and went, how in the heck am I ever going to get a job? There's so many of us. <laughs> uh, and I had a few friends who were going back to do their honours year and so I sort of just followed them along, did that. Had a lot more fun, I suppose, doing that because it was much more self-directed. There was, we sort of had a supervisor and a thesis and things like that. That was great. Decided I definitely wasn't coming back to do a PhD, but just went home and had a holiday and didn't really look for a job again. So come the next year, I was back starting a PhD. And I also didn't really know what I wanted to do. So that was, it doesn't sound like a very good reason to do a PhD, but I, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And I thought, well, that's at least something. Mm -hmm. um, so I started that and ended up continuing that. I did it in the area of advanced ceramics basically um so fuel cells ceramic fuel cells which is sort of coming into a bit more in vogue again now that hydrogen, the hydrogen economy is rolling around again mm -hmm. um so i was sort of in an area that these days would be in sometimes in um chemical engineering department and sometimes in a chemistry department depending on the university so that's what i did it in uh, and i finally sort of finished and handed in and the one thing i did learn from doing a phd and being part of a university setup uh, is that I decided it probably wasn't staying in academia probably wasn't for me although having a PhD at that point in time that was sort of what you were best qualified to do was to go and do a postdoc or apply for those kind of positions mm -hmm. so I went off into the wide world to look for something else yeah how did you stumble across education um 
basically in a job ad, um, as simple as that. Um, in the paper back then, it would be on Seek these days, I guess. I had just sort of was browsing through, looking at all sorts of jobs that sounded interesting that required a science background. You certainly didn't need a PhD to do the job I did. It was probably in the realm of science communication. Most of the people I met through science education and, and I guess later through Scope um, were science communicators or had done um, a degree at ANU, I think, which is called science communication, maybe in the oh, science okay. circus and things like that. So, But I didn't know any of that existed when I went through. Mm-hmm. Had I, maybe I would have gone a different path. Um, but yeah, I quite literally saw a job ad. It sounded interesting. I still don't quite know how I got the job over other people um, because they were possibly better qualified in terms of having, I'd never taught primary school kids or high school kids for that matter before I'd done a bit of tutoring. I enjoyed tutoring at uni and all of that sort of thing, but mm. had never, didn't really have, I suppose, the, the job experience that other people might've had, but nonetheless, someone took a chance and that was that. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, it's funny that you mentioned the um, Totally Wild approaching CSIRO because I think, or I'm not sure if it's exactly the same show. I think it might be, but I think they still approach CSIRO um, because I used to work at CSIRO and I remember an email coming around being like, we're looking for someone to talk on this to go on um, Totally Wild. So. Yep, no, that sounds exactly right. They, they had quite a close, close relationship for a while with CSIRO. They sort of had a I think a, a researcher at CSIRO was one day a week of someone's time. It was mine for a little while, but then it moved to someone else to sort of try and find stories within CSIRO that they could run. And I think Totally Wild liked and, and then Scope liked having that sort of attachment of, you know, being produced in conjunction with CSIRO. And CSIRO had a big emphasis at the time and still do to a degree on education and, and getting science mm-hmm. out to the younger generation. So it, it was a good fit for both sides. So, yep, it's, it's been going – it was going along before I started and before Scope started – um, probably went right up till the end, I imagine, yeah. What What was your, like, in, in the realm of television, what do you think was your favourite part of working in television, I guess? Because it's a, I, it's quite a rare experience that I feel like not many people do get to um, be the face of um, an extremely large television show. Yeah, look, definitely. Um, I, I realised probably right from the start doing very odd segments on Totally Wild when someone, when I would go back home to the Sunshine Coast and someone would say, oh, I saw you on the telly. I'm like, oh, okay. Like I, I never saw them back because they were on at four o'clock in the afternoon and I was usually working then. Mm. Um, occasionally my parents would record one, but I suddenly realised that, you know, 300,000 odd people a week were sort of watching. It was on before The Bold and Beautiful, so often they were in the older demographic. <laughs> um, um, so my parents' age or more, but they would sort of come up and see me and that's sort of when it dawned, I suppose, that even though... I watched Totally Wild in bits and pieces. There were lots of people that watched it a lot. Mm. Um, and it so it became with Scope. So I was aware pretty early on that it was a pretty lucky role to have. I'd asked Totally Wild presenters when I'd sort of seen them, you know, how did you end up getting your job? Not really because I necessarily wanted their job. I just didn't know. Mm, yeah. And by and large, it was sort of by accident. They'd sort of said, oh, I was doing this and I, you know, someone knew someone or this happened. And I'm like, this is no process. This is, <laughs> how does anyone who actually wants your job get your job? And then the same thing happened to me. Basically, it just happened to be in the right place at the right time, I suppose, when Scope started and they said, look, let's, you know, you're with CSIRO, we want CSIRO involved. So it just sort of happened. I think for me, the the most enjoyable part of it was probably the, you had a fair bit of creative license mm-hmm. in that working in kids TV, to a degree, you weren't, you were left alone by the network because you weren't on in prime time, because you mm-hmm. weren't a big budget show they didn't worry about you and that had its negatives in that they didn't think of you when they wanted someone to be interviewed on the project about something science. You know, you know, you have a scientist on your own. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but at the same time, they also, you didn't get a lot of scrutiny. So you could do some, you could have some crazy ideas or do some crazy things and it was great. So you could have a lot of fun making, you know, you, with a limited budget doing sort of whatever you wanted to make the science interesting or fun or that sort of thing. And you could just kind of do it. You, we were sort of our own little unit, our own little boss. We didn't have to run things past too many people. Um, and that was what was really fun. So the people were fun to work with. Mm. They were very much a mixture of science and non-science people. At times there were three or four of us in the unit that had a science background. At times I was the only one um, because you really need a lot of TV people to be able to make a TV show yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's probably more important to have them. If I'd been left in charge, it probably wouldn't have been quite as interesting a show. And it was often that tug of war. Sometimes I'd think something was going to make a really good story and someone's mm. going, 
yeah, but what are we going to see? This is like, remember, it's TV. We, you, viruses are great, but our, kids are going to switch off if we just have someone talking for, like, yeah, okay, all right, all right, let's mm. go back and think about that again. So, yeah, the creative side of it was was probably what I enjoyed the most. Well, what was your funnest, craziest experiment then that you got to work on, do you think? Um, or some of your top ones. Yeah, okay. One that um, we really, I really enjoyed doing was creating um, a big pool of cornflower slime. Oh, yeah. Um, so that was fun. I'd, um, I'd seen it on a YouTube clip somewhere in, I think it was a Spanish TV show. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And I did the maths on what they had done. I thought, oh, we can't make one that big. Oh. I think they'd used a concrete mixer to mix all of theirs up. Oh, right. Uh, as in a concrete truck, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, but I thought if we could make something that, that had a bit of depth and all that, that'd be really cool. Um, and just working out where to buy that much corn flour was was <laughs> Difficult, and we ended up having to buy it by the little boxes and rip them all open. So, oh, really? Um, but that was fun. We sort of and, and we did mix it in. We hired a concrete mixer for the day and mixed it all in there. So that was that was kind of fun, just doing all of that. And I got to repeat that. I guess a few years later on an American TV show, I got invited to be on the Rachel Ray show. But we still really don't know how that came about. I think <laughs> I think Australia must have been Flavor of the Month, and they were scouring the internet. And I got an email out of the blue: Would you like to come across to New York and you know do a, a couple of science segments? I'm like, Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't think my work's going to pay for me to go over there. <laughs> they said, no, no, that's all right. We'll pay for you to go over. Let, let's come up with some ideas. So one of the ideas was a cornflower bath and I just told them what to put in it and then we kind of got there and it wasn't thick enough. And I oh, went, and then what do we do? Well, you know, we're, we're filming in, in a couple of hours and we need more cornflower. So they just they sent their minions out to shops all over <laughs> Brooklyn to buy up all the cornflower they could find <laughs> and we just kept adding and adding and adding until we had something you could run on and dance on. And then if you stopped, you just sunk knee deep in and couldn't get out of. Um, so that was definitely a highlight, making huge quantities of that. Um, getting getting to go behind the scenes at some of the wildlife parks. Like I remember, you know, getting to swim with dolphins, um, which was kind of cool. And we had a sketch that we were filming in there, which the dolphins were sort of part of, um, where, you know, I was sort of competing with them to try and get the squid or get the whatever. And it was just, I remember getting out of the pool that day and kind of going, that was that was really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, you don't sort of think of it at the time. You just sort of go, I'm going to do this. Or the camera's over there. We'll get this shot and do that. And you know, there's just dolphins either side of me and they're chucking squid at all of us and I'm yeah. trying to catch them. <laughs> <laughs> the things you do for children's television. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Oh, that's, that's really awesome. Honestly, I feel like you must have a lot of like unique experiences from that as, as a result. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, I mean, so many times you would go places and go, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And then they say, mm. oh, come back here. And you would sort of go either behind the scenes or go to their side of it and just see even more, I suppose. And, yeah, yeah. and people were very forthcoming, I think, because whilst it was TV, it was also kids' TV, so they're really keen to get involved and really keen to show you as much as they could and explain as much. It was really amazing how much when you went somewhere because they weren't really getting a lot out of it other than a bit of exposure on, on a kids' program. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, they were giving up their time, um, but they were still prepared to do – so much you know ride a jetpack around or do this or do that just just because we turned up with a camera basically so yeah yeah a lot of great experiences yeah that's that's really awesome um i guess on kind of a different note um how how was it like like having the impact that you did on like children of i guess kind of my generation and around my generation yeah, and it, it probably took a while for that to seep through. I think it was probably scope had probably been going a few years um, before we got a. I think Channel Ten got a an email or a message from um, I think what they call they call Enhanced TV or Screen Rights or something. Essentially, it's the body that distributes content, media content to schools. And at the end of every year, they sort of do a bit of a tally up of who's used what and then divide up some money to the commercial networks based on licenses or something like that. So essentially, Channel 10 was getting some money for however many schools might use scope. Um, and it would turned out to be they sort of sent the reports and went, oh, you guys are doing, look, look at all the schools that are using scope. I'm like, oh, I'd never imagined that it could be or would be used. I guess it made sense, but it had never occurred to me that schools were using episodes or segments to show in class. So that was sort of the start of me realising that it wasn't just people or kids who were really interested in science already who might be sitting down to watch it, but people were actually being shown it as a, a sort of a, an education tool, I guess. Um, and then bumping into kids who are going, oh, I watch your show, I really like science, you know, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. And then later on, to be honest, probably that, that's nice, but then bumping into people who are 
at uni or just out of uni who said, oh, yeah, I used to watch Scope all the time. You know, that's the reason I do science now or I've chosen this or I'm doing that. That was probably even more satisfying, I suppose, because whether it was the reason or not, I don't, don't know, but at least there was that connection that had gone all the way through. So, yeah, really, and it still happens from time to time, you know, be out of the Brisbane Lions or something and someone like, hey, Dr. Rob, yeah, I do this. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool, great. Yeah. Well, honestly, I feel like um, like I, it was my main exposure to science that I was able to access when I was um, younger and probably did lead me a lot of the way to following science and then going on to engineering, which is, I suppose, a little bit different. But I yeah, It's kind of would've... applied science, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would have reached that point. And um, not only that, it's, yeah, I worked at CSIRO. I only wanted to work at CSIRO because I feel like I had grown up watching so much like CSIRO television and being able to um, like be exposed to all of the really cool things that they get to do there. Oh, that, that, oh, look, I'll, I'll have to uh, tell the good people at CSIRO if I'm still in contact <laughs> with that because I'm sure that would be something they would like to hear whilst these days they've sort of, they do things differently there. They don't sort of have the visit the schools things as much anymore, but they have a lot of national programs that are still in and around schools. So they're still very active, um, I guess, getting science out to to younger people, whereas the bigger companies tend to sort of focus on year 11 and 12 because that's when they want, want to sort of grab them once yeah. they've decided, yeah, yeah. oh, you're going to be that great. Well, make sure you come and work for Rio or BHP or whoever it yeah. might be, you know, or yeah. come to our university. Yeah, 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 definitely. So now that, um, yeah, Scope is all wrapped up, what's what's the story for after Scope? What's- so the, the reason I finished up on Scope was mainly because – I had something else that I really wanted to do. I don't think I would have left otherwise. I'd sort of always had in my head, like at some point this will end, whether um, as has happened just recently, whether the the network sort of goes, well, that's it. It's Mm -hmm. time is up. And look, that was always a possibility. I realized a couple of years in that the only reason really Totally Wild and Scope existed in the first place was legislation from the government that said all commercial networks need to make a certain number of hours of kids television. And it has to be on and these hours of the day. So we really only existed as a sort of a contractual obligation with the government, which was good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but at least it meant we were going. But I thought, gee, with a stroke of a pen, the moment they changed that legislation, which the moment there were multi-channels or ABC had its own kids' channel or all of this, any of those could have been reasons to scrap the legislation, mm-hmm. then I can't imagine Channel 10 or 9 or 7 continuing their kids' stuff because they'd see it as an expense. So I knew that its shelf life was limited, though that never really made me want to get out. I was having too much fun, I suppose. Um, But the reason I did end up deciding to um, call time was I had this sort of other project I wanted to work on to see if it would kind of go somewhere. It was essentially a a science-based resource or website for schools to use. And it came out of the fact that Scope got used quite a bit in schools, but it's quite a it's TV's passive. You sit and watch it and that's it. You know, it's interesting, but you don't do anything. Whereas particularly in primary school, you want to get kids on doing experiments, I guess, which is what I used to do with CSIRO and, you know, what some schools do probably better than others. And a lot of primary school teachers don't have a science background and some of them are actively probably hesitant to do a lot of science. So that if I can make a resource that makes it really easy for them to do science in the schools or for non-science specialists just to bring in science if it's in the, within the curriculum, um, that'd be great. So that was the reason I left and that was the plan and that's still going along. It's bubbling along. I found out it's a lot harder to sort of convince schools to change the way they do things than I thought it might be. Um, but look, there's a lot of parents and homeschoolers that are kind of using it. So it's it's getting there slowly. So it's not my sort of full-time job. I sort of work on that on the side. Um, I've done... About six months a year, I work for the World Science Festival Brisbane, putting together their sort of science content, which is, again, great because it's it's creative. It's probably more adult science, for want of a better way to put it. But it's really nice to get my head in that as well. And I wrote some kids' books sort of along the way as well. So, yeah, lots of bits and pieces, none of which are full-time employment, but all of which is pretty fun and fulfilling. Mm, yeah. yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, well, I think that's kind of all my questions. Just for a little wrap up, do you have any advice for perhaps those people um, about to start university or um, in university for kind of how they can find their path in like what they want to do and what interests them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the chances are you'll end up on a couple of different paths like I have and most people these days. I think very much are gone the days when, well, not completely gone. I'm sure there's still some professions where you – get out of uni you start work as a vet for example and you work as a vet for the rest of your life and maybe that's um one of the careers that is sort of 
pretty much a straight line, but I think many others use zigzag all, all over the place. I would just say, which was advice that was given to me by a few people along the way, stick with what you find really interesting and you're passionate about. Um, it may not result in the first job that you want to get to, but if you sort of focus on that, you'll definitely find you want to go to work, which is always a good start. Yeah. Um, but you'll also want to study. If you know if it's something you're studying that's interesting, um, then you'll sort of hopefully skew towards that as a career and you'll be able to find the jobs in that area. And as I said, so I didn't know science communication was a career mm. even though that's what I knew I was sort of interested in so I just sort of went oh this CSIRO education sounds like it might be interesting I get to talk to kids about science I like that I'll do that as a job and then I found out later it's a thing yeah. so I think I think that's probably my best bit of advice follow as much as you can what you're most interested in about your area um, rather than just sort of doing what everyone says will pay the most or whatever because mm. you'll probably pretty quickly learn that a well-paid boring job is not the one you really want to do for the rest of your life yeah yeah I definitely agree I I feel like I hear especially in engineering people who study it because they kind of want to find just a well-paying job and that's it but I think it's definitely worth putting in the time to at least look at something you are a little bit passionate about or a little bit interested in and see where that leads and yeah you might end up finding something that you're actually really interested in and you're really excited to work on rather than yeah, something you're just complacent with. <laughs> uh, def definitely. I mean, uh, you know, you're going to be working a fair bit of your life. You know, you might only study for three, four, five years of it. So you might be able to put up with it studying, but it's a whole lot more. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to be working for 20 or 30 years, you want to have be able to get some sort of enjoyment out of it. You know, a little, a lot, whatever it might be, everyone's different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Don't, don't just settle for something that uh, is going to pay the bills if you don't have to. Yeah. Oh, actually, one thing you mentioned, you mentioned about writing books. How was that? Uh, that was good. Uh, again, that kind of came about by accident. I got an email. I get emails out of the blue, which is good. <laughs> I email out of the blue from a publisher who said, have you ever thought about writing kids' books? And at the time, I just just finished up on Scope. I think I might have still been on long service leave with CSIRO or something complicated. Hmm. And I said, uh, well, sure. Doesn't everyone want to write a book? Uh, but just so you know, I'm not actually at Scope anymore. And they said, no, no, that's, that's fine. Just... Um, start sending through ideas. So I sort of sent through a few ideas and um, they ended up liking the one about sort of a, a group of, I say kids, I guess they're sort of middle school age kids uh, who kind of use their sciencey skills to kind of solve mysteries and crimes basically. Um, and they thought that was a good idea. So I just sort of went, all right, well, I don't know how to write a book. So I started off by sort of writing on one page roughly where I thought the plot would go. Mm -hmm and who the characters would be and then just sort of went from there and ended up sort of writing four across the year and a couple of them are published already. Um, and I really wanted to sort of sprinkle – so that it's, it's, a, it's a fiction book but there's a lot of factual stuff through it. So the science they do is sort of real and then there's weird facts or experiments you can try at home sort of through the book as well or even puzzles and number puzzles and that sort of thing. So that sort of stuff is sprinkled through as well because as a kid – those were the kind of books that I really liked. So I thought, I'd, yeah. I'd love it if there was a book. So I, I basically wrote a book that I thought I would like as a kid. Now, whether or not <laughs> that's still the case, I'm not sure. But I liked that idea that there were lots of those sort of uh, things scattered throughout it, I guess. So, um, yes, they're called the FART Files, which actually stands for Forensic Amateur Research Team, the <laughs> F-A-R-T. But the publisher liked the idea of that, having that as an acronym. Whether, whether or not some kids have bought the book and then gone, this is not what I thought it was going to be, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it was a lot of, again, it was that creative process, I guess, of just going, well, yeah, I've got a blank bit of paper here. This can be whatever I want it to be. Um, but it was fun. I realised how many typos I make when uh, I write, when, especially when you get up to that many words, um, when someone yeah. else looks through and goes, what's this, 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 this? And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did you find, like, writing so so much? Um, I basically, I suppose I just sort of didn't, I didn't really know how many words it was going to end up being. I just sort of started, I guess, and, mm. and just started writing and wrote each section to what I thought it needed to be and when I felt I was about halfway through I sort of checked went, oh okay all right that sounds about right and I asked the publishers how many words should this be and he goes well I don't know what are you up to and, all right that's good yeah. <laughs> um, and you know they did all the illustrations as in I sort of handed the words over to them and they had an illustrator who sort of put ad hoc illustrations sort of through it which was really nice it was just it was so nice to see the finished product and kind of go oh this is really cool it's got my name on the front and it's got these illustrations and it's just it was just really nice to see it all come together, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, yeah, I really just sort of started at the start and started writing and then when I got to what I thought was the end, I looked back and went, all right, well, it's 25,000 words. I guess that's how long my book is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, like, I guess with 
kind of related to that book, but I suppose you would have had to um, present and talk about a lot of different areas of science that weren't necessarily like your basis or your specialty. How did you find, I guess, being kind of exposed to the, all the different areas and how did you adjust? Well, that, that was probably another really great thing about both working at CSIRO and at Scope was that every week was something new. You know, I might have been talking about uh, genetics with some year 12 biology students or rocks and fossils and dinosaurs with year two kids. So where you pitched it at CSIRO or even at Scope, you know, every week was different. And I really kind of liked that, I guess. And that was part of the reason I suppose I didn't end up wanting to study chemistry in academia was I just felt you were getting narrowed down more and more to a little area. Um, and of course, there are academics who don't. They have broad interests. But I really liked all sorts of different things. And, and look, a great example is probably when I was at CSIRO in my first year there, I learned that you could turn purple cabbage into an acid base indicator. And I, this was after, you know, seven and a half years of studying chemistry um, at university. I'm like, why has no one, why have I never found out this before? Why has this never come across my path? This is amazing that you can take <laughs> plant chemicals and they produce seven or eight different colors depending on, you know, what you add to them. And I just thought that was amazing. Um, and I think that's when I sort of realized that I, I really want to find, there's so many amazing things out there in the world that I don't know at the moment. And that was what was good about Scope was every week being forced to go, all right, well, you know, this week's we're doing, it's all about buoyancy or this. And I go, all right, well, let's let's find out what I don't know about that. And, and there's always stuff out there that's interesting. Whereas if you just sort of stay in one area, you don't get to go through that. And look, the, the science festival's been the same, having to <laughs> talk to eminent uh, professionals in their area of synthetic biology or whatever it might be mm. before I speak to them. I go, well, I better sit down and do my homework and work out what it is they do because I've heard of this, but I don't really know enough about it. Yeah. And they go, wow, well, this is really interesting. Yeah. So I, I, I'm still really fascinated by pretty much everything. Um, there's some things I understand better than others. String theory still eludes me a little bit, but it's just nice to, to chop and change. So I really like having to just jump into something, find out all about it and then concentrate on that for a bit and hopefully retain as much of that as I can before I jump into the next thing yeah yeah that's awesome do you find you're able to retain a lot of it not as much as Dr Carl um you look a fair bit often when even whether it's my kids or other people sort of say oh you know I have this question for you. oh yes now they'll ask me I, I can usually get the broad brushstroke of the answer mm -hmm. right um sometimes it's the facts and figures will still elude me um, mm. and that's where Dr. Carl is. Mm. Dr. Carl, the man is amazing. He just mm. plugs facts and figures and studies out yeah. of his brain and he'll know you know exactly how many light years it is across the Milky Way galaxy or whatever the numbers are. He just, he knows them. He can always flesh those things out. So yeah, in answer to your question, I probably find I retain a reasonable amount of it mm. um, and certainly continue to go, you know what, I'm pretty sure it's this, but just, just double check that I'm right there. I'm not remembering something else. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's nice to uh, it's nice to have all that kind of swirling around. It's just yeah. it would be nice if it was organised as it is with Dr. Carl's brain. But <laughs> however that works, <laughs> he's got he's got the right shaped brain for facts and figures. Like yeah, and he, and look, he he always sort of says, "Oh, I'm not very good at remembering things. I just <laughs> you know, I do this or I do lots of research. Or I study stuff." But he is really good at remembering things, whatever he might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, so do you have any closing remarks then? Uh, since that's probably my last question. Uh, look, I don't think so, other than the fact that um, it was, it's was it been a great ride over this many years. And when I was at university, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And if that is also you, that's okay. <laughs> um, just go with, I don't know what I wanted to do, but I'll keep doing what I like until I find out what it is that I want to do. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much sure. for joining me. It was really wonderful to have you on. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Router, and we hope to see you next time.